Good morning, church family. If you are able to and you are in the room or our overflow room, why don't you join me and stand to your feet right now? Online family and friends, we are so thankful that you're joining us this morning. Wherever you find yourself, we are so excited to worship the Lord with you. As you are standing and maybe finding your your spot in the room, in whatever room you might find yourself, during our pre-service prayer with our staff team, we heard the most exciting report As you walk with Jesus, I don't know if you've ever had those moments or actually I know who I'm talking to, you've had millions of them. As you walk with the Lord, there's something that you've been praying into. You feel it's an assignment from the Lord or there's a focus that God has given you to prophesy into and to trust God for breakthrough in. And it might be miles away or someone you don't know, but you know that God has placed that in your heart. How many of you have had those journeys with Jesus? Yeah, I I know our church family. And as we have gone after trusting God to move in specific regions that are known as unreached people groups, John and Cindy Taylor shared the most divine appointment with us. I'm going to invite John Taylor to just come up to the front and to share that with us this morning. Hey, well, y'all remember that God's given us a prayer focus this year. If you look around, we've got 12 different unreached people groups that are represented by these flags. And this week, I was asked to to meet with a couple and have a coffee. And when we sat down and met this couple, guess what? They are actually ethnic Kyrgyz. So Kyrgyzstan, if you look back in the back of the room and that flag, the, the red flag back there, that uh, represents the nation of Kyrgyzstan. And I had this coffee with this couple. They're just delightful. 20 years ago, they found Jesus. And God's been working in their heart. And you know, they're some of the first missionaries God has sent out from Kyrgyzstan to Central Asia to other places. So, you know, God is on the move. He's already at work to reach these unreached peoples. And would you just put your hands up over here? They're sitting right over here. We'd just like to welcome them this morning right here. Just welcome today to be here. We just stretch out our hands to you. We bless you. We pray God's anointing and power over your lives and ministries. And it's just a delight to have you with us. Thank you, God, for what you're doing in our midst. We just pray you continue drawing these nations, drawing these unreached peoples to you for the glory of your name, Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. You'll notice if you're watching online that the cameras aren't on them. They are doing such important work, way more important work than I am doing right now. So they cannot be on camera at this time. But church family, if the Lord speaks to you, you have a word of encouragement or or something, let's pour in powerfully to this incredible, incredible couple. This is a sign the Lord is moving in the most unexpected of places. I was reminded as one of our alumni came up to me last weekend in this service, and she was holding her young daughter, and she had shared with me that about a year and a half ago, in our first year environment, I had the joy of ministering with my husband, Richard, and he gave a word to her that I was quite offended with. He started saying to her, I see you with a daughter and I see you pregnant and began to prophesy over her. And because we're part of a community and a school, we found out some feedback that it was really painful for her because for many years she has physically been diagnosed with a few things that she's unable to have children. And on top of that, she was in a really painful physical season of her life. And she made me take a video to share with my husband because she said in her next cycle, she supernaturally conceived a baby and a daughter. And I don't know if she's in the the sanctuary right now. You can give me a wave if you're here, but she was with us last week and she has a one and a half, or I think nearly a two and a half year old, healthy, perfect in every way. 
And I just have such an expectation this morning. We're going to greet each other in a second that God is doing unexpected things in our midst. Whether you're trusting for breakthrough or you're praying for something far off, God is on the move in radically unexpected places. So take a moment right now, turn to your neighbor. If you're in the chat, won't you greet them, find out their name. Jesus is about to move in their lives. And then we're going to step in to worship together.
of your glory and grace let the things of this world I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus
stand, why don't you stand with us? If you're able to stand, stand with us. How, how many of you need the name of Jesus spoken over your mind, <laughs> over your heart? Oh. Uh, right here, Jesus, right here. Yeah, right here. I was thinking early this morning about uh, Israel in the wilderness, which is just like a favorite story of mine, so I use that as a reference so much for, for our walk with the Lord. But what uh, fascinates me is 
is the Lord at night showed up as light, as a burn, as a fire. But in the day, when it was hot and sunny, he showed up as a cloud. He showed up opposite to his surroundings. So how does he show up in sickness? How does he show up in a recession? See, he shows up opposite to the condition. He shows up he shows up as the solution. When he reveals himself to Moses as the great I am, it's almost like he invited us fill in the blank. I am provision. I am abundance. I am healing. And uh, whether you know it or not, that person next to you really needed to hear that. They, they needed it. And they need for you to pray that into them right now. So all I want you to do is grab a hand, put a hand on their shoulder, somehow make connection with people around you, and just start praying, God, show up as abundance in their lack. Show up as healing in their sickness. Show up as peace in their conflict. For a whole online family, we declare the same over you, that Jesus would show up as the solution, as the answer, as the great I am. Yeah, we just declare abundance where there's lack, joy where there's been depression. Health where there's been frailty. Now we're gonna have a second part of this prayer. I what I what I'm looking for this morning is not just that abundance would show up for you where there's been lack or joy where there's been discouragement, but that you would be the living example of that to the city that you would be joy where there's been discouragement. You would be abundance. So I want you to pray that into, into that person, that they would be a living example, the personification of the solution that Jesus brings. Just pray that into one another right now. Father, I, I just pray that you would enable us, give us the grace to just to manifest Jesus all throughout our city, all throughout this region. We ask this for the honor of the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen, amen. That's awesome. Listen, you've got some great people around you. Find out who they are. Bless them really good. Find your places. Welcome, welcome, everybody. If you have, there's so many people here today. If you have seats next to you, could you raise your hand really quickly? If you need a seat, you can head to the overflow or you can find someone with their hand raised that looks nice and sit next to them. 
Someone with a kind face. You can do that. Well, we'd like to, okay, you can put your hands down. I think that's good, because I have another question. Is anybody, it's your first time here at Bethel, first time joining us at church? There you go, raise your hand high. We wanna welcome you, we wanna welcome you. If you're next to them, say hello. Welcome, keep your hands up. If it's your first time here, keep your hands up. Our ushers have something special for you. So that's good. And uh, if it's not your first time here, welcome back. Congratulations, you made it this morning. You, you, you should be more excited about that, but that's okay. That's fine. It's just church, just the Lord we're meeting with today. That's, don't worry about it. So we're good. Well, welcome. If you're online, welcome with us today. It's easier for you to find a seat than people in the room, but uh, welcome day. We got a few verbal announcements and then uh, we got some news. The first one is Josh is with us this morning. Look, come, come on up here. But don't say anything. You did, you did enough singing and stuff already this morning. It's my turn. So Josh is here. This is Josh's family, if you didn't know. And if you look at all of his Instagram, YouTube, wonderful things, he's, uh, he's back visiting home where he should be. Home. But it's fine. We'll lend him to Nashville, wherever, wherever, wherever place that needs the Lord. We'll lend him for right now. But Josh is back. And like family, we're going to celebrate today. You have a new album out. Actually, babe, can you hand me that thing right there? Look, I... T- I'm not, this is not, a, I'm not a newbie at announcements, Josh. This is, look, do you see this right here? Uh, this is J- Josh's big face on an album. Yeah, okay. He could have put a cross or anything, but he decided to go with his face on the, on the album. So that's okay. Uh, anyway, Josh is going to be out in the lobby. If you want to help support family, that was horrible. I'm so sorry. That was, <laughs> that was good. Um, if you want to support, he's got lots of stuff. I picked up a, a sweater today. I'm, I'm the model for the sweater. That deserved more claps than it got. But um, if, you want to, if you want to pick uh, an album up or anything like that, I'm gonna, you didn't tell me, but I'm going to give this. No, I'm giving it away. Oh, yeah, I have Do you, you have them. Yeah, does anybody here collect, collect vinyl? And I don't know why you do, but <laughs> my, yeah, yeah. My daughter now collects vinyl because it's cool, but uh, it does. Anyways, anybody collect vinyl who's not on staff? Who's not on staff? If, okay, uh, right in the back, right there, you have your hand up. Yeah, no, no, right. Yep, you put your hand like this sideways, and now it's back up. Yeah, that's you. Come on. There you go. Thank you, John. All right, and then as well, this kind of congratulations to you. Josh will sign that for you in the back if you want. Yeah. And then along with uh, Josh is going to be, I don't know if you're going to be, but we have Bethel uh, Worship School is coming up July 10th through the 19th. So that's amazing. Uh, What they're doing for for us as a Bethel family, or uh, I believe if you're online as a Bethel family, uh, they're giving $100 off to worship school. Uh, The promo code is Bethel100, and you can go to BethelMusic.com slash worship school, I believe, and you can check that out. And uh, yeah, that's it for the verbals. Why don't you go ahead and check out uh, Church News? Thank you for joining us, Bethel family. My name is Michelle Thompson. I'm a volunteer elder, and I get to volunteer with an amazing group of women at Life with Littles and Life with Middles. She's also a real life elder because she just did 40 as well. So, you know, I'm Jenna Zitt. I am a deacon and my husband and I teach a few classes here at Bethel Church. Here is this week's church news. Bethel Christian School has an Encounter High School Discipleship Program. This is for any students between grades nine and 12. Spots are available for the 2024-2025 school year. So apply now by going to bcsreading.org slash admissions. It's an amazing program. Join Dave Hill's wholehearted parenting class starting on March 5th to learn foundational tools for raising your children. We'll explore cultivating connection, communicating boundaries, and depositing our faith into our kids. Mm. Register now at Bethel.com slash equip. My husband and I actually took this class last year, and it's so worth it. Get there. It's three weeks, but it's well worth your investment. The Leadership Activation Day is designed to partner with Bethel Leaders Summit and give you practical tools for activating the supernatural in your environment. Join us on March 9th by purchasing your tickets now by going to Bethel.com events. 
Join the Armstrongs for their Dream Life School of Interpretation, March 13th through the 15th. Their focus is to stir a passion for dreams and visions and to train and equip in interpretation. Reserve your seat now by going to Bethel.com slash events. You don't want to miss it. They carry such an anointing so true. in this realm. And I just do it. Get your ticket. Get your ticket. Thank you for joining us. And we hope you have an amazing week ahead of you. If you missed any of these announcements, please find them at Bethel.com Church News. Now we have a special video from Bethel Music Worship School. So stay tuned. We need a generation of worship leaders that are willing to be developed and will stop chasing the need to be discovered. A lot of Christian worship music out there, but I'm not seeing a correlation in breakthrough in culture. The Lord is coming to remind a people that He doesn't want to build beside you. He wants to build within you. It is not our gift that's gonna set the captives free. Your gift is not going to heal anybody. Your Holy Spirit does that. You are rooted in the kingdom of heaven. That stream, that river that flows from the throne of God is to flow in and through us until He is able to communicate and release into the earth things that have never been seen or heard before. How would you worship if you weren't afraid of anything? Anything is possible. It's like the room is ignited and we have faith. From this room, things should be said, books could be written, songs could be sung, spontaneous moments that actually shape the next hundred years of church history. And my prayer is this week, God does something in us so that He can do something so major through us. I just wish that I played an instrument or something, you know? Just I've always wanted to go to that school. Anybody in the room that is at Bethel Church because of School of Worship? I, I was saying in first service, I meet people all the time who moved here for School of Worship. Such a stunning event. Um, so I get to share a cool story with you uh, before I take the offering today, before we receive tithes and offerings. But a couple of weeks ago, actually the Lord started stirring some really good hunger and anticipation in my heart before the prophetic conference started a couple weeks ago. And I had this wildly bizarre thing happen. I, I got a new cell phone, which I only do like twice a decade. It's about how often I get a new phone. And so I finally decided to go and get myself a new phone, brought it home. I felt really proud of it, but I didn't have a um, screen protector on it. It got put down on my, my kitchen counter, buried in things. My kids were around. There's no telling what happened. And a couple hours later, I went to pick my cell phone back up and there was a big a crack across diagonally across the top of the screen. And I was not happy about that. And I instantly called my husband because I'm a verbal processor. I just had to tell him how angry I was with myself and whatever else happened in the home that day to break my brand new phone. And I was already thinking about how this is just annoying. Now I have to go spend more money to get it fixed. It's brand, just that whole, I don't lose things or break things, you know? Anybody like that? I'm like, Ugh! I'm not used to this. This is really annoying. So I spent a couple of days, <clears throat> um, morning. And every time I would take my phone out, I'd kind of like rub my fingernail over the groove of the crack and just be frustrated, you know, until uh, Tuesday before the prophetic conference started, I went to the grocery store with my son. We got back in the car after getting our groceries and I pulled my phone out to call Jason and tell him that I was on my way home. And I noticed that the crack had started like that flaky cracking off the little shards of glass that happen sometimes when you crack your phone. So I was like, great, now it's splintering or something. Like it's just extra cracked now. So I actually went to wipe the dust away, the, the shards of glass. And as I wiped my thumb across the screen, the crack fully disappeared. I promise that happened. And I looked at it again and I thought, I am so glad Jason saw this crack because if he hadn't seen it, and if I hadn't spent two days going over the groove of it with my fingernail, I would be checking myself in somewhere because I thought <laughs> I'm either nuts or I just saw the most pointless miracle. <laughs> 
that's ever happened. <laughs> and then to make it even more wild, I showed up the first day of the prophetic conference, very excited, very hungry. And Julian Adams released a word the first night of the conference and said he felt like we were moving into a season of unnecessary miracles. How cool is that? And as he was talking about it, he shared with us at the conference that, you know, where there is a mindset of scarcity, unnecessary miracles are actually pretty offensive. And I felt that deep in my heart. The, when, when the crack disappeared and I got home and I showed Jay, part of our conversation was, this is so unimportant. <laughs> like on a serious note, my mom died in September. I'm believing for breakthrough in all kinds of areas of my life. Why in the world does my cell phone matter? It does not matter. But as Julian released that word that night, I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit come. And I felt like he said to me that when, when the Lord comes and releases that unex, uh, the unexpected and the unnecessary miracle, it's to remind us that he is with us now, whether we understand it or not. We can actually trust him with the plot. We can trust him with the storyline. He is with us and he's bringing us those reminders. And so as, why don't you stand up? We're gonna receive tithes and offerings today. And as we do, I really believe that the Lord is A, gonna stir up expectation for the miraculous. B, he is going to be renewing our mindsets because we need the mind of Christ to actually expect the abundance that he has in store for us. And I believe that he is gonna set our faith as we give into today's offering. We can actually give and sow into the kingdom of God with such great expectation, knowing that whether we understand what he's up to or not, he is moving and he is working on our behalf and through us and in us. So why don't we receive uh, today's offering? At, and before we do, we're gonna read offering reading number two today. We did the first offering one in first service, and the second one just feels like the right one to read in this service. So we're gonna read offering reading number two, ready? As we receive today's offering, we are believing you for heaven opened, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created, dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, impartations, and divine manifestations anointings, giftings, and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free, carrying kingdom revelation. Thank you, Father, that as I join my value system to yours, you will shower favor, blessing, and increase upon me so I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, I do pray over today's uh, tithe and offering and I just ask that as we give, you would renew our minds, that you would set our hearts and minds towards heaven, that you would help us see as you see and that you would bless and over abundantly bless this gift that is given today in Jesus name, amen. There's a screen that shows you how to give. Ushers are gonna go ahead and pass the buckets. And as you give, into your, uh, as you give today, remember that your tithe belongs in your home church, but you are welcome to sow into what God God's doing here at Bethel as well. So we bless you. And why don't you welcome Pastor Chris as he comes to preach this morning. I love that story. That's a great story. You can sit down. I just left Twin View and they, uh, uh, about a month ago, I was, I was preaching in there and they were standing and shouting. I said, man, you guys need white hankies, you know? I, I preach in black churches where they have white hankies. And so I went in there today and they had handed out white hankies <laughs> and I'm preaching in there. <laughs> it was so fun. I liked it. So uh, that's your challenge. <laughs> Let's do it. There we go, right there. There we go, right there. Richard in the front row. Got the hanky. Oh my gosh, streamers. Oh my gosh, people are pulling them out already. Good job, I don't know. Yeah, it's better than getting th uh, shoes thrown at you. Well, let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for this day. 
We ask your blessing on the word today and on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I had a miracle this week. I, I preached at the Littles, Moms with Littles. And there was like, I don't know, 30, 40 Littles in the room, and I survived. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, I was like, okay, what do you preach to these people, you know, because I've only done it once before. And, and so the night before, I was kind of a little bit anxious. I actually, this is the only place I've preached recently where I'm nervous when I preach. And I confessed it to them. I'm like, hey, I'm nervous. And because people say, well, if you confess your weakness, it'll go away. But it, it didn't. <laughs> I was nervous the whole time. But I did have this dream. And I don't know what was in the dream. But when I woke up from the dream, I just heard the word grit grit. And I feel like the Lord is instilling grit in his people. I love this word grit. So I, I preach to the, to the, uh, the moms about grit. And I, I want to just pick up that theme. You know, uh, if you haven't been here, I'll recap a little bit of what I've shared for the last month and a half. And that is in December, I had a prophetic word that we were opening. There was an opening of a whole new era and that January would be the beginning of halftime. And that halftime was not just a place, a time to rest, but like, I, don't, I, love, uh, I love the NFL and the NBA. And oftentimes at halftime, you, uh, you're graded actually as a coach and as players by how you make adjustments at halftime. And teams that are losing at halftime often win because they watch film and they make adjustments. And I shared that uh, analogy about the NFL. I actually used the, the NFL as an example and, uh, and then that, two weeks later, the 49ers were playing in the, um, in, in the game that determined who was going to the Super Bowl, the NFC Championship. And they were down at halftime, 24 to seven, and I got so mad, I turned the TV off. You know, you know I always say, you know, when you go, oh, it's just a game, you always say that when your team loses. <laughs> but when they win, it's like, this is history. <laughs> So my team is losing badly and I have, uh, you know, the role of intercession. So I was just so disgusted. I just turned it off and I was getting ready to preach Sunday night anyway. So right before I went to preach, I got, I got on my app and I'm like, I wonder how badly they lost. And I turn it on, I turn it, I get on the app and then like, it's tied. And it's the end of the third quarter. I call Leslie, I'm going to be a few minutes late. I have to intercede for this team. <laughs> it's a world changing moment. <laughs> And they come back and win. And I was like, oh man, what a great example. I shared it on Sunday. And then two weeks later, my team wins. After halftime, they made adjustments. It's a prophetic declaration. Then the Super Bowl came along. The 49ers were ahead at halftime. I'm like, this cannot be happening. And then they lost. So it was a double answer to not my prayer. Um, but we're talking about making adjustments. And so we've been really looking at the book of Nehemiah for about four weeks. And Nehemiah, his name means comforter. And he's actually sent by a king to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, the first thing they did in Jerusalem is they set up the temple. They built, they built the temple in the book of Ezra. And then later on, Nehemiah goes and sent by a king to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And it's such a beautiful picture in our own lives because the first thing that happens in our own life is we receive Jesus and he sets up, he sets up the temple. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. It, it, it's almost like building a beautiful temple in a, in a dilapidated neighborhood sometimes because he sets up his temple in, and we haven't set up the walls, we haven't set up the gates. The walls being, Isaiah 6 says, you call your wall salvation and you call your gates praise. And so often the Holy Spirit sets up his temple inside of us. He takes residence inside of us, but the moral walls, our financial walls, our relational walls, our, you just name whatever wall you're talking about, often those walls are broken down. And the next thing that happens is that the, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, is with the decree from the king, comes and begins to rebuild our walls. And so this is a beautiful parable, actually. It's a true story, but it's a parable of our own life, how the Lord rebuilds our walls, how it's sent by a king, like the Holy Spirit is sent by the king to actually rebuild the walls of our life. And so it's a beautiful picture. And then in chapter two, in chapter one, um, the, the uh, Nehemiah, Prays. The first thing he does, he prays and intercedes. And we have a, a, a high priest who is interceding and praying for us. In chapter two, and this is the a chapter we took a couple of weeks on this chapter. The next thing that happens is Nehemiah, he rides around the outside of the wall. It takes him all, I think like 18, 19 hours. And he surveys the walls, making notes 
of where the broken, destructive places of the wall and gates are destroyed. And he just goes from wall to wall and gate to gate, and they just ha- he has a scribe with him, and they're just literally scribing all the broken places. And I want to point out that, and then, oh, let me, let me go to this point. And then he comes to the, the leaders, the elders of the city, and he says, do you see the bad situation we are in? And I'd like to point out that if you can't look at your problem and still have hope, you don't have faith, you have fantasy. One of the things that happens in this, in, at halftime is that we look back, not with regret, but we look back with Holy Spirit analysis of what things in our life could improve. Where could we, you know, could I say, kind of watching film with the Holy Spirit, not watching film with, the, with shame, not watching film with our friend condemnation, but watching film with the Holy Spirit going, this needs to be fixed. Here's areas I, I have ignored for years. Here's areas that I, I, I have never gotten victory. And the Holy Spirit's like, this is a new day. It's, it's half time. It's time for a strategy that actually rebuilds the broken places in our life and sets up the gates of our life. And so... We talked about that, that chapter uh, two of Nehemiah about surveying our walls and our gates and we did a couple, three messages on that. Today I wanna talk about developing grit in our life and how do we actually develop courage and what does God calling us to do? So look at Nehemiah chapter four. We're gonna read quite a bit of scripture today. And now it came about, this is verse one, when Sambelot heard that we were rebuilding the wall he became furious and very angry, and he mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of the brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria, saying, what are these feeble Jews doing? What are, are, they going to, are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish it in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burnt ones? Now Tobiah the Amorite was near him, and he said, whatever they are building, a fox would jump on it and break down their, their stone wall. And I, I, I want to point out a dynamic that I see in my own life and I hear about often as, as one of the shepherds of this house, it feels like when you have a decree from the king and you begin to rebuild the walls of your life, all of a sudden you encounter enemies. And I, I've heard people say this, maybe you've said it, man, before I knew Christ, life was so peaceful. Yeah, because you would row, row, row your boat gently down the cesspool stream and you had no resistance because you were on your way to hell. But as soon as you stand for something, something stands against you. It's not a sign like, well, the devil's after me. No, you're after him. You're rebuilding things in territories that are yours that you've never taken. And all of a sudden, you end up with enemies like Sam Bell and Tobiah and Gershom. And they begin to demean you. They begin to accuse you. They begin to call you names. They begin to question the reality of your ability to actually succeed. And I I just, I want to remind you that the enemy is accusing you day and night and his voice is pretty silent as long as you agree with him, but it's pretty loud whenever you're doing something worth actually doing. I'd like to point out the only people that don't have bugs on their windshield are people that never leave the garage. (laughs) Nehemiah chapter four, verse 12. When the Jews who lived near us came and told us 10 times they're coming up against us from every place where we turn, then I stationed men in the lowest places, uh, spaces between the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed people in families with swords, spears, and bows. I, I want to stop for just a minute and say this. I believe that this next era is the era of the Lord anointing families to take back this generation. I believe that, that children are arrows in the hands of warriors. I believe that there is a generation rising. It's not just old people. It's not just middle-aged people. It's not just young people. It's one generation standing up against this demented generation and saying, no more, not on my watch. And the Lord is stationing families in the exposed places of the walls and protecting the gates and walls of people who are trying to rebuild their lives. Listen, I want to say to you too, if you're in the rebuild of your life, maybe you have a porn problem, maybe you have a financial addiction, Maybe you have, you know, all of these things that have happened to, to many of us, all of us in some way. When, when God is restoring you, he brings you families who can stand in the wall while you're rebuilding your life. Listen, you were never designed to do it yourself. If you have a porn problem, you have an addiction, you have something that you've had for years, you're like, it's a new day. Chris prophesied that I'm going to win. I'm like, you're going to win, but not by yourself. 
You're going to win by confessing your sins. You're going to win by being in fellowship. You're going to win by saying to your brothers, can you stand in this wall while I come back here and rebuild my life with Holy Spirit? And so the Lord is anointing. The walls of Jerusalem were torn down for 114 years. They tried to rebuild the walls for 72 years. And what they couldn't do in 72 years, Nehemiah did in 52 days. It's the greatest building miracle, I think, in the entire Bible. That they restored the walls in 52 years. But look how they did it. They are laying bricks and building gates. Okay, pretty practical, right? Laying bricks and building gates. But Nehemiah takes it from laying bricks and building gates, and he says, fight for your families. He said, listen to this. He said, Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. How did Nehemiah rebuild the wall? He made it about family. He said, listen, you're not just building a wall. You're restoring your integrity. You're causing the gates of your life. You're keeping your children from having, being accessed by people who should not access your children. You are protecting your children. You are watching over your wives. You are taking care of your husbands. And he says, this isn't just a wall. This is a new generation that has integrity. And I believe the Lord is raising up a generation that has integrity. Chapter 6, verse 1. We're going to jump ahead a couple of chapters. Now when it was reported to Sambelat, Tobiah, and Gershom, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and that no breach remained in it, although at the time they had not set up the gates, uh, the doors and the gates. Then Sambelat and Gershom sent a message to me saying, Come, let us meet together in Sherem, in the valley of Ono. Now, has anyone else ever been in the valley of Ono? <laughs> let me just give you some advice. When the enemy wants you to meet in the valley of Ono, don't go to Ono. <laughs> Should just write that in your mind. Don't go to Ono. Because everyone's shaking their heads like, I've been to Ono. Oh, it's like, Come and negotiate with us in the valley of oh no. <laughs> and I love Nehemiah's response. He says, I, he said, he sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave and come down to you? Hey, here's the first part of building grit in your life. Know that what you're doing matters to God. Yes. Let me say it again. The first part of building grit in my life is that I know I'm doing something that freaking matters. I can't come talk to you because I'm doing something great for God. I don't have time to go down in the valley of, oh no, because I'm up here and I know. I know I'm doing a great work for God. I can't be disturbed with people who will want to talk about the bugs on my windshield because they stay in the garage and do nothing and just accuse people who actually do something. That's a good word. Verse 9. They're all trying to frighten us. Get that white... Come on. Let's do this. Let's do this, okay. For they're all trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged with the work and it won't be done. Now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. And when entered the house of Shemaiah, the, da- the son of Deliah, who was confined at home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you at night. I, I-, I want to point out that the enemy would love for us to close the doors of the church and remain in the church and don't get into culture. Don't go out there because, listen, there's a separation between church and state. I don't know how you separate the church from the state when the kingdom's within me and everywhere I go, the church goes with me. I'm just pointing out that there's a religious spirit that would love... That it has a religious kind of connotation that says, you know, just do it in those walls. Don't go out, lock those walls down, and you'll have peace. You have peace because you, you're living in fantasy. Not, huh. I've been called to make disciples of nations, not just to congregate in a... I love you guys. But there are others. <laughs> okay. There are others. So, but Nehemiah said this, 
should a man like me flee? He, they're saying, the, the, the enemy's saying, you should stay in the church. They're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you at night. And he says, should a man like me flee? Here, here's the second part of grit. Know who you are. Second part of courage. First part is, or maybe, I don't know if they're reversed in Nehemiah, but Nehemiah, they're, they're reversed. First, I know I'm doing something for God. I would say, first, know who you are. First, know. Should a man like me flee? Listen, people like me don't run from you. I'm not going down in the valley of, oh no. I'm not listening to you. I'm not hiding in the temple. I'm not gonna hide behind religion. I'm not gonna just quote scriptures I never live out. I'm not gonna just hate immorality and do nothing about it. I'm not going to live in a castle separated from people who actually need the love of God and the power of righteousness. I'm not going to do it. Should a man like me run? And then he says, uh, I, I'll, should a man like me flee? And could one like me stay in the temple to save his life? I'll not go in. And then look at the next verse says, verse 12 says, then I perceived that surely God had not sent them. And here's a, here's a powerful verse. But he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. There's a lot of bad prophecy going on, folks. Yeah. We, got, we got social media prophets all over the place, prophesying all kinds of crap. They have no accountability, don't live anywhere hate the church because they don't go to the church. <laughs> oh, I better not go on because I know this will be a two minute clip on social media. <laughs> and they'll be like, here's his entire message. He said it in three words. And like, yeah, I know. And he said, then it goes on to say, he was hired for this reason that I might become frightened and act accordingly and sin. Do you know that when you know, we think of sin like I did something immoral, but you know that when God's called you and you stop the work God's called you to because of fear, that that is sin. Wow. Nehemiah is like, you're wanting me to sin by stopping the work. I usually think of sin as something I've done wrong. Here, Nehemiah goes, I'm gonna sin because you're trying to get me to sin by stopping the work God has called me to do. Do you know that when we let fear tell us what to do, we're actually in sin? Do you know that when we reduce our life to accommodate fear, that we're actually in sin? Listen, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm trying to make people mad. That's right. Come on, sir. I'm trying to get you angry. I actually had a whole passage I deleted because I was like, we need to like have turnover table anger, righteous anger that says, I won't stop. I'm not, you're, okay. That. And then it says this, remember the Lord. Remember, O God, Tobiah and Sambel, according to these works of theirs, and Nodadiah the prophetess and the rest of the prophets who were trying to frighten me. So the wall was complete on the 25th of the month of Elu in 52 days. What an amazing miracle. The wall was complete. I believe that the Lord is rebuilding the walls of morality. We are in a, we're in a, a moral free fall in culture, but it's a new season. Come on. Come on. 60 years of downward spiral in morality. And I believe that God is holding up a big stop sign. And on one side it says stop and the other side says get grit. Yes. I was thinking of the story last night as I was preparing of, in Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the king sets up a golden statue and says to all of his constituents, come out and worship the statue. When you hear the sound of worship, bow down to the statue. And you can imagine, I don't know how many people there are in this large, probably field, probably a million people, two million people. They're just spread out everywhere. It kind of reminds me of a Reinhard Bonnke uh, you know, crusade that you've seen where there's just just waves of people. You just, as far as the eye can see, there's people. And when they hear the sound of worship, they fall down and there's three guys. <laughs> I don't know if they're like, I'll do it if you'll do it. I don't know how that went down. <laughs> I'm not gonna bow if you're not gonna bow. I don't, I don't know how they did it, but somehow they decided that they weren't gonna bow down. I, I don't know about you, but I, 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 if I was with them, I don't know how I'd do that. I, I mean, like, hey, maybe just like, give it a little kneel, you know? 
I'm like, let's just be a little politically correct. I mean, I think the king's got a bad reputation for killing people who don't listen to him. And so um, they, they get called out. And uh, the king hears that they don't bow. And you know this part of the story. So Nebuchadnezzar gets these three boys and he says, hey, maybe you didn't hear the decree. Maybe you didn't understand clearly. Maybe, maybe you didn't get the news. Maybe you didn't read the email I sent you. <laughs> Here's the situation. See that statue? Now, when we play these instruments, you guys, you understanding guys? You just, just bow down. And when one of the boys says, hey, uh, yeah, we, we, we don't even need to instruct us because we ain't doing that. And the king's like, well, if you don't do it, I'm gonna put you in the furnace and you're gonna die. And they go, well, if we die, we die. But let me tell you, I, we believe, right guys, three of us came to this conclusion together. <laughs> We're still together in this, right? Okay, we believe, tell them Shadrach, yeah, we believe, been to go, yeah, we're, yeah, he's right. We're in this together and we believe that God's gonna save us. But even if he doesn't, we ain't bowing down to your statue. The king gets so mad that he tells the soldiers, make the furnace 10 times hotter. They stoke the furnace and they take the boys to the furnace. And when they open the door of the furnace, the fire is so hot, it consumes the soldiers that are throwing them in there. And they throw the three boys in there and, and Nebuchadnezzar's watching this whole thing. And he says to the guys, hey, how many guys did we throw in there? <laughs> and they're like, Shadrach, Meshach, and three. They go, he goes, there's four in there. there look guys, look at this. There's four in there, and one looks like the Son of God. I, I, <laughs> I, I just, like, Valentin, do, do, do you have a point? I, I do. It, it, sometimes the press is forcing the hand of the enemy, but there's a fourth man in the fire. I, I don't know about you, but I'm like, Lord. Lord, if you send me the fourth man, I'll go in the fire. And the Lord's like, go in the fire, I'll send you the fourth man. Come on, I'm like, have the three of you talked about this? Like, <laughs> and, and I wanted to say to you, like, the Lord is calling us to a place where there are certain things you can only learn in the press, the fire affliction, and the man in the furnace, the fourth man, the furnace is with you. I just have this deep sense that the, fourth, the Lord is sending the fourth man into our press. Yeah. I don't know what you're going through, but I have a deep sense that we are pressing ahead and pressing ahead always causes trouble. Yes. It always creates a press. Listen, when you're row, row, rowing your boat down, gently down the cesspool stream, it's amazing how you hear the, you know, I was gonna say the flowers singing, I don't know, <laughs> the birds singing, the birds singing, and the butterflies, and then all of a sudden you decide to take a stand and all of a sudden, there's all this persecution, this craziness, and you're like, what's going wrong? And I propose something's going right. And it's like, you don't wanna jump out of the fire, you wanna stay in the fire because in the fire is the fourth man. I believe the Lord is sitting the fourth man in the fire, that God is not the light at the end of the tunnel. He's the light in the tunnel. I love this. The word of the Lord is grit. We must lead this generation out of the victim mentality and the entitlement sick syndrome. Yeah. Let me just say it again. The word of the Lord is great. We must lead this generation out of the victim mentality and the entitlement sick syndrome. Listen, there are real victims in our culture, real victims, and we should protect them. We should love them. We see that what's happening in the church and in the world, there are real victims. But when you have a victim culture and you have a victim mentality, the victims that are real victims don't get taken care of because everyone else thinks they're a victim. Right. Think, well, government should do something for me. Somebody should do something for me. I don't like the church because they didn't do anything for me. It's like, someone should take care of me. It's like, I want to say this. Nobody's coming till you get in the fire. Then the fourth man will meet you there. But you just wound, wound, whined, whining. And... <laughs> whining. I was trying to say three or four words at once. I love this quote. It is not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out this, 
how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done it better. The credit belongs to the man who actually is in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again, who knows enthusiasts and great devotions, who spends himself in this worthy cause, who at best knows at the end the triumph of high achievement, or, at, or who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place will never be with those timid souls who never know neither victory nor defeat. And I, I, I just have this deep sense that God is calling us to get in the arena. Are, are you with me? God is calling us to get in the arena. Not watch it as spectators. Get in the fight. I feel so peaceful. You feel peaceful because you're not doing anything. And I'm not saying you. I'm saying those other people. You know those other people? Those people. I'm reminded of the story of Esther. Sorry, just telling story after story. I'm, I'm reminded of the story of Esther and Mordecai. And Mordecai is a, a, a Jew. And of course, Esther is his, uh, it's actually his cousin. But Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman, who's a narcissistic, egotist, humanist. And everyone's supposed to bow to him. And Mordecai's like, I'm not bound to him. And Mordecai says, I only bow to God, not to men. Well, Mordecai, I'm sorry, Haman gets so mad that he finally builds gallows to hang Mordecai on him. And he gets a decree from the king to kill all the Jews. And the king is so disconnected, he didn't even know that his queen is a Jew. So he signs a decree with the signet ring, cannot be turned, you can't, you can't be turned around, can't be reversed. And as soon as Mordecai finds out, he ends up at the palace wall. He can't go in, so he rips his clothes, he puts on sackcloth, he throws ashes on his head, and he's making a big scene. Esther looks out the window, sees her uncle Mordecai acting like a fool, and she sends him new clothes and says, you know, chillax. <laughs> hey, you know, you're hurting the family name here. Chillax. Calm down. Here, put on some clothes. You don't look dignified. And Mordecai sends her a message. He said to Esther, do not imagine that you in the king's palace can, be, can escape any more than all these Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house, you will perish. And who knows whether you have obtained, who knows whether or not you've retained royalty for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go assemble all the Jews who are found in Susa and fast for me and do not eat or drink for three days or nights that I and my maidens may also fast in the same way. And thus I will go to the king, which is not according to the law. And if I die, I die. You know, Esther is sipping suds with the king in the palace. She's so disconnected with the people she's leading that she didn't even know they made a decree. Her uncle Mordecai has to tell her that the king she's sleeping with actually made a decree against Jews. She's so disconnected with the people she's supposed to be leading. She's not just a princess, she's a queen. And Mordecai says to her, Esther, don't think that because you were in a palace sipping suds, that you aren't going to die along with your people. And by the way, this is a sovereign move of God. So God will, make, he will raise someone else up to take the place to save the Jews. But you're going to perish. And she says to him, all right, I get it. I'll go to the king. And if I die, I die. And I, I feel like it's important for us to come out of our religious castles 
and actually get down in this, in, into the cesspool of the people we're supposed to be leading. Feel their pain. Understand the problem. It's not just, hey, send you a book and hey, here's my book on how to cheer up when you're having a bad time. Yeah, here's my book on, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you got it. It's like we're getting so isolated from culture and the enemy's like, stay in the church. Don't get involved. Listen, people are going to say bad things about you if you get involved. Just get on Chris's social pages. You'll see it all the time. Just say anything. People will hate you for it. Other people love you for it. It's like, listen, you can't take the temperature and decide what your opinion is. Like, I, I'm saying this second half is about us getting involved. I'm not get, talking about just getting involved in politics. I'm talking about getting involved in culture. I'm talking about needing, needing, needing the, the, the leaven with the dough with the leaven of righteousness. I'm talking about taking a stand. Stop being quiet. Well, my friend's not going to like me. They don't actually, listen, if they knew who you were, they wouldn't like you. I'd rather be hated for who I am than love for who I'm not. I'm trying. If we don't rise up against this evil in our day, who will? Who will find the courage to step to stop Haman's insanity? Who, who, he who wants to destroy Mord the Mordecai's who refuse to bow down to the arrogance of an evil, ta evil taskmaster who tries to steal the innocence of an entire generation. Yeah. I have a, a friend named Darren. He's the uh, pastor of Garden Church in the Los Angeles area, and he had a prophetic encounter. He sent to me two days ago. He, said, he wrote this, This morning I was rattled by a phrase that has led to a deep sense of prophetic unction and urgency to both declare it and to release it so it can be heard. And here's the declaration he heard. Gen Z will become Gen Zeal. Yes. Gen Z will become Gen Zeal. Yes. I believe that's a prophetic declaration that Gen Z will become Gen Zeal. Yes. I want to tell you that, that the church is, there's, there's a morphing in the church that's unhealthy. There's a good part. I'm talking about the bad part right now. And that is, you know, we got prodigals who we want to see come home. And they, the prodigals have been with prostitutes and they're in the pig farm. And the father desperately wants them back. He goes into the field of dreams, in the field of expectations, day after day looking for his son. But the one thing he doesn't do is to create a house of prostitution to get his, get his son back. He waits for his son to have a heart of repentance, long for his father. Are you with me? I'm pointing out that we are trying to relate to a generation by becoming like them, and they're looking for something different. They're, I'm saying there's a generation rising up. They are actually looking for people who will stand for something that will not be the generation of, I don't know what sex I am, I can change tomorrow. They're looking for something solid, something powerful. And I want to point out that Gen Z, that, that youth, it, it, the youth will be to us like arrows in hands of warriors. I'm pointing out that we're in the womb of the dawn and the youth will be like dew. Child, your children will be arrows in the hands of warriors. Like they will be part. It's a family affair. This is a family fight. Your children are involved in the fight. They are not victims. They are warriors. We are raising up kids that aren't victims. This is what I was sharing with the, with the, with the ladies. Like you are raising up a generation of warriors. You're raising up Davids. You're raising up Samsons. You're raising up Samuels. You're raising up Moses. Like with the children that are growing up in your, in, in your house, you are sharpening their arrows. You are teaching them warfare. You are saying you will not be deluded. You will not be, you will not. <laughs> I, I'm telling you that this generation, the enemy is going to be afraid of our children going to public school. Remember who you are. You are not a religious, radical, out of touch rea with reality, dinosauric nutcase. <laughs> I made up that word, dinosauric. It tried it try, <laughs> it try to spell check. I'm like, no, that's the word I want, dinosauric. <laughs> you are not a religious, radical, out of touch with reality, dinosauric nutcase. You are righteous lovers of God who love people with a passion to see them fully alive, 
free from the demonic oppression, delivered from suicide, walking in pure joy of a clean conscience. You are a prophetic people who ache to see people who have lost connection with their creator, restored and reconciled, so that they can discover the divine call, walk in their heavenly purpose, and find peace that surpasses all understanding. It's time to stand up. How, how do you develop grit? I'm gonna give you just a few quick ways because I'm getting close to the end. Number one, hang out with courageous people. You hang out with wimps, you'll become wimpy. That's uh, Proverbs 32. <laughs> hang out with wimps and become wimpy. Listen, the children of Israel didn't go into the promised land because of who they hung out with. The 10 spies said, we can't go. Two spies said, we can. They said, no, no, let's hang out with these guys. And I'm telling you, you hang out with people who are fearful and afraid and you end up in the safety of doing nothing with your life. I love this part. Joshua and Caleb were the only two that outlived those stupid people and they went into the promised land after 40 years of delay and took the promised land. And the thing that kept everyone out of the promised land, the others, was giants. And do you know, there's no recorded battle with a giant. I know Caleb probably fought some, but they weren't even notable. Mm -hmm. And the only giant they encountered that was notable, 370 years later, they encountered a giant that's notable in the promised land, the thing that kept them out, and a 15-year-old boy killed it with a freaking rock. <laughs> like you keep listening to people who let fear tell them what to do and you end up standing on the shores of the, of the wilderness looking at the promised land wishing and hoping and your life is over and you've done nothing because you listen to these people who are afraid and they have prophets who prophesy fear I, I love you know we have uh, uh, we, we teach people when you get bad prophetic words just flush them I love European toilets because they have two flushers. <laughs> they got the number one flusher. You don't need a lot. But then you have the profit flusher. That's the flusher where you got, it's a lot of crap. You just flush that down. <laughs> or you don't even want to talk about the ones on the plane. You flush that thing. You can't sit on it. You swap your tongue down into your stomach. And, Sometimes the prophecies are that bad. You just get one of those airline. <laughs> Bill's in the front row telling me to pull up. How do you get, how do you develop grit? You hang around with courageous people. Number two, get a vision. Get a vision. Get, vision gives pain a purpose. The dogs of doom stand at the doors of destiny. The dogs that do stand at the doors of destiny. Like, get a vision. Vision will give pain a purpose. Why am I going through this? Because of that. It's for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. You gotta have a vision. You can't just endure a cross. You gotta have a vision. What, I, why am I in all this pain? Because that's your destiny. You're giving that promised land to your children's children. Number three, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Don't stop hoping. The longer thing. Number four, keep a victory journal. You should keep a victory journal. Every time you have a victory, write it down. Then go back, and when you get scared, read the victory journal. You're like, man, I'm scared. And then you're like, oh, God paid off my house. And when we thought our daughter was going to die, she didn't die. As a matter of fact, she's still alive, and she's doing great. She's a pastor of church. And we thought our finances were over. Then somebody came and paid off our house. And we thought our life, and it's like, you just read those. And you're like, now I'm ready, okay. You read those before you leave the house. <laughs> Number uh, five. Keep short accounts of your failures. And number six, I'm gonna finish with this one. Find something to protect. Part of the challenge is we live in a castle and we hear so much bad news on a screen. And we're like, these people were murdered, these things happened, this person was raped, these terrible things happened, this school system's going to hell, this is happening, that's happening. And we have so much bad news that we, we sort of get you know, inoculated from it. And then what happens is you get down in the trenches where these things are happening to people and you get righteously angry. You're like, how come someone's not doing something about this? But you're not going to get righteously angry unless you actually get in the trench. Like something happens. You're like, I don't feel motivated. That's because you're in your castle. 
looking up the castle window. You want to get motivated? Get in the cesspool with those people. You know why? Because there's something in you that wants righteousness and justice. Okay, I wrote this. It's going to be, I'm going to end with it. It's a little harsh. The Lord is calling. <laughs> well, I just thought I'd protect you. I did scratch out some words from first service, so it's a little, I'm giving you the dumbed down virgin, vir, virgin, virgin. My goodness. The Lord is calling fathers to stand up for their daughters that are being bulldozed back in the dark ages of oppression as men disguised as women steal their gold medals, infiltrate their bathrooms and locker rooms, and violate their decency. Fathers and mothers, we need to take a righteous stand and let politicians and school boards know that our children will not be participating in their social experiment. Nor will we be pawns in some demented political ploy to give pornographers and drag queens access to our kindergartners in the name of love and equal rights. Our educational institutions have become indoctrinational centers in which the in which the brainwashing of our children is turning into demented realities. We must stop this now. It's time, it's past half time, it's time to put a stop to fatal fail failed social experiments. When psychologists and psychiatrists claim that a boy who thinks he's a girl is normal or a girl who thinks she's a boy is normal, the patients have taken over the psych ward. When the ridiculous is protected by our highest courts and common sense is ancient history, something is seriously, seriously wrong. The moral walls of our nation have crumbled and the people who have access to the gates of our children are irreprehensible. It's time for revival to become a revolution and a revolution to become a reformation. Parents must push past the fear and get some sex education and teach your children about sexuality and morality because sexuality and morality must never be separated. It's paramount that we deal with people struggling with sin and sickness and mental illness with kindness and with gentleness and with compassion. We mustn't make the victims of oppression the target of our zeal or passion. Otherwise, we join the victimizers, shaming and hurting them. But we must take a stand for righteousness against those who are stealing our children's innocence and perverting an entire generation. Let me read it again. But we must take a stand for righteousness against those who are stealing our children's innocence and perverting an entire generation. I want to tell you something that came to me just last service. You know, less than 60 years ago, we had black people separated into different schools and different restrooms, and we, we oppressed them. And let me tell you, it was the popular thing to do. It was the person you would vote for that wanted those those kind of separations, those kinds of abuses, those kind of oppressions of, a, of an entire race. Today, 50 years from now, women with no breasts and men will no, with no penises will stand up and accuse this generation of not protecting them while they were children. Mark my words. There'll be thousands of lawsuits from children who, who were in a perverted culture whose parents did not protect them, who cut off their breasts, who cut off their penises, who caused them to have puberty blockers that destroyed their lives. And they will accuse this generation and say, why didn't you protect me? And the politicians that we vote in right now, they'll be running for cover. Just like every politician who voted for racism, voted racism in, was popular in one day, and now they're all trying to lose their history, scrub their history. I'm telling you, this generation is ri that's rising is a generation that's going to shift the course of history. It's a generation that's sick of the cesspool of sin, and it's families. It's not just fathers. It's not just mothers, but it's families who have taken their place in the wall, saying, not on my shift. I'm not going back in that valley of, oh no. And I see a movement rising where people are beginning to say, not on my watch, this isn't happening with my children, and it's time for us to get involved, stand in the cesspool. Listen, I'm not making a political statement. It isn't just about politics. As a matter of fact, politics, in my mind, are they, they, they are the symptom of a righteous people who refuse to actually get involved in culture. 
It's time for us to get involved. I don't know what to do. Listen, you won't know what to do till you get in the fire. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be a fourth man with you. You'll know exactly what to do because the Holy Spirit is in you and he is reforming the culture. I'm telling you, we are a disruptive movement. Bethel is a disruptive yes. movement. Right. Bethel is a disruptive movement. The Holy Spirit has made us a di disruptive movement. It would not be my, well, it would be my nature. It would not be Bill's nature to be disruptive. <laughs> Sorry, man, I almost accused you of being someone else. But you can't help it when the Holy Spirit's on you. You have to speak up. You must not be silent. So would you stand? No, it's, it's, there's voting time, so please vote. Please vote. And I, I have this, I wrote this down this morning. I have no loyalty to a political party. I have no loyalty to a political party. I know you might think I do. I know I'm accused of it. My loyalty is with the King of Kings. I, I, I don't vote my party. I don't vote my party. I vote my conscience. I want to challenge you to do the same. Don't vote your party. You're Republican, you're Democrat, don't vote your party. Vote your conscience. Ask Holy Spirit. I, I believe there's a breakout. I believe that there's going to be, you know, even in the political world, we're going to see people go both ways, but we're going to see God, I'm going to see righteousness rule. We're going to see leaders who are righteous, rule. Yes. And I believe that the body of Christ is gonna shift the course of history. Yes. I'll tell you one thing, California is shifting. The next 25 years, there'll be an earthquake of shift in California yes. as we are moving towards righteousness. We are moving towards the protection of our children and we are gonna reform what happens in the educational system of our children. Yes. So Lord, I bless everyone in this room. I pray God that you would give them grit that you would give them grit. I pray for the most fearful person to suddenly be <laughs> like the Chris Overstreets of our life, the Tracy Evans of our life. I, I pray God that this, that this season will be marked by the fearful who become the powerful and lead us. The Gideons who are so fearful, being anointed by angels, by anointed by God and stepping out of the crowd and we all go, it must be God. They would never do that. That woman would never behave like that. That man, I've known him forever. He, he, he's a mouse and he, he's become a lion. I don't know what happened to him. And Lord, I just bless this generation in Jesus' name. May we shift the course of history over the next 20 years. May righteousness be in again. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. What a powerful word. Hey, I, I'm, uh, my name's Dave. I'm the children's pastor. Can we take 30 seconds to pray for kids? There's about 750 kids that come here every week. Which, can we just take 30 seconds to pray for them? Lord, I just thank you that when you needed a giant slate, you took a kid. Lord, when you needed to feed a crowd, you took a kid. When you needed to look after deliverer, you used a kid. Lord, I thank you for the children that you're raising up, Lord, the paradigms in them, the heart postures in them to be courageous. Father, would you just... Keep pouring your love and your truth into their hearts, Lord. May they, may they fight, Lord, where we, have, where we have failed. And Lord, may we stand up and defend them. Lord, may we provide a place for them to grow and to hear your voice. May they be ones who know your voice and who speak your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, um, the time for courage is now. It's, it's today. And, um, and Jesus is so kind to us. When we don't feel courage, he says, blessed to the poor in spirit. Blessed to those who don't have grit. That's what he says. And so um, if you don't feel courage or if you think you're needing someone to stand with you for extra courage, I want to invite you to come down the front. I just want to invite the ministry team to come. Uh, we, we want to stand with you. We want to stand and declare hope and truth and, um, and Jesus in your family, Jesus in whatever situation um, you need help with. And so one of the first steps towards grit, towards um, character is to learn to receive. And so we want to do that. I also just want to provide an opportunity. Is there anyone here who has never received Jesus for the first time? You know, Jesus is, um, um, just put your hand up if that's you. If, uh, Jesus is the one who gives us grit. He's the one who gives us strength. He's the one who saves us. Is there anyone here who's not, who's not done that? I just want to give you opportunity to receive. Well, that's great. Well, I just want to pray a blessing on you. Father, I just thank you so much for the message. Lord, would you give us courage? Would you give, give us courage to protect the love in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace? Would you give us courage to speak up? Would you give us the courage to speak truth in love? In Jesus' name, amen.
Have a great week. Make sure you give someone a hug on the way out. Make sure you take your belongings too. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Wow, wow, wow. Wow, so good. So good. Such a good word. Powerful worship. And if you want to respond, um, as Dave was saying, that you feel like uh, upgrade and courage, that uh, even praying over your kids, like grabbing your kids, and um, there's something on families right now that's so, so powerful. And then also, if you are watching and you don't yet know Jesus, uh, Dave, at the end, gave a call if you want to receive Jesus. And so if that is you, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus came um, to take away your sin, your shame, give you life and life to the full. And so if you don't yet know this Jesus, but your heart is burning within you, you want to say yes to Him, you want to start a new life um, with Him that uh, is Him as your Lord and Savior. He wipes the slate clean. I just believe there's people here, that are, are people watching, that God is like, I have a new thing for you. And, and it's good. you get born again, you get brand new. And so um, if that is you, go ahead and put in the chat, I need Jesus. And we have a team that would love to pray with you and, and minister to you and walk you through that process. So go ahead and put, I need Jesus, if that's you. Yeah. And just a reminder, like we're meant to be this together, like this word courage that Chris brought, you know, it's interesting The you know, it wasn't just one man that stood up and went into the fire. It was three. And there's something about being in the company of people that are willing to take a stand together. Mm -hmm. And it's really fascinating when you, when you look at these great exploits from men and women of history that maybe in some military contract, uh, conflict or something that they displayed such bravery and courage, you see a theme that they did it when they talk. Why, why would you do that? Like Medal of Honor recipients. And they're like, because the people I was with, I'd know that, I knew that they, they would do the same thing. And there's something about Courage is imparted, not when you work something up, but when you're around someone else that you know has your back and will back you up as well. And so there's, we're in this together. We can't, we can't see a shift. We can't see a change by trying to do it on our own. We're a body for a reason. And I just feel this encouragement of like, find the, the two or three people that you can take a stand with, that you can take uh, courage with to actually go forward because it's, it's the presence of others, the company of others that give us the courage to step out and actually act. It's such a good word. I think that's, I, I want to encourage you as well, that doesn't have to be people uh, in close proximity in, yeah. in terms of like, I can reach out and touch you. Like this is the beauty of us gathering online yeah. is that, and, and it's something we believe that the Lord putting in our heart to increase our, um, the community that we have online, the sense of belonging, the sense of unity uh, is because there are pioneers all over the globe. We just got one of our team sent us a map of everyone that was watching live today that we are connected to people all over the globe that are saying, yes, we want to be a people of courage. We want to see God move. And so we want to pray for you, but also know if you don't have a couple of people that are physically around you, you have a company online with you. And so I even want to pray for divine connections that you'll see people in the chat or people will say something and there'll be uh, Zooms and things that we're doing where you're able to connect with others and be set on fire with them. And so, Steve, let's pray. Yes. Let's pray for courage. Um, and then again, if you do have um, prayer requests as well, Kimberly, we see you saying, I need uh, prayer for parenting wisdom, going through a really tough time. Um, and so, yeah, we're going we're gonna to pray for, for kids and parenting wisdom as well. But Father, we thank you um, that you are the God who imparts courage. That God, when you stand with us, I have this picture of us, us standing and moving and the line of Judah roaring behind us. That, that, that there's, this, there's this fierceness that the Lord um, moves with us. And so God, I thank you. Even Lauren's word that she shared in the offering, that God is with us. That there would be such a sense of you with us. And when you are with us, I just heard this word, I turn fear into fun. I turn fear into fun, that this sense of God is with us. There's a sense of adventure instead of paralyzing fear. And so, God, I thank you for imparting courage to every person listening live, watching back in the name of Jesus. Yeah, Father, may history look back on today and know that we did not compromise, we did not step down, that we actually chose to hang on to what you've said and you've promised. And, Father, I thank you for a company of believers taking a stand 
to not be immovable, Father, that we would be families set on fire for God, that we would be families that would defer to each other, that would prioritize each other, that we would love each other, that we would uh, laugh together. And Father, I just thank you for courage being released over us. And Father, I thank you for just connecting with people, like-minded people, whether in close proximity or even online through FaceTime or through Zoom or whatever it may be. Father, I thank you for a community of people coming together to take a stand, to go after, to see the kingdoms of this world bow to the name of Jesus, that we would see heaven come to earth. And I just feel this thing like many of us for so long have been praying like, oh God, won't you just bring heaven to earth, bring heaven to earth. And I just feel this thing of this mindset shift of like, no, I'm actually going to, with God, bring heaven to earth. It's not this thing where I'm gonna be passive and I'm gonna be waiting, but recognizing the kingdom of God is within me. And so therefore I'm gonna partner with him to see heaven start being made manifest even right now. And so I just wanna pray over those that maybe you're not in uh, ministry, maybe you're in business, or maybe you're in healthcare, maybe you're in education or politics, or whatever it is in the creative space. Father, I thank you for like-minded, like-hearted people being connected with them in those spaces. And I thank you for them taking a stand to see heaven touch earth and their realm of influence. And Father, we thank you for families being transformed. We thank you for kids having an encounter with God. We thank you for relationships being restored and healed in Jesus' name. And we thank you for boldness and courage and fire in Jesus' name. Yeah, we bless families. We see Kimberly, we saw read out earlier, asking for wisdom in parenting. And we released that over every person with kids. Natalia, I saw you asking for prayer for your marriage, that we bless families right now in the name of Jesus. We speak over your home, that it would be filled with the presence of Jesus. We speak over your relationships with your kids, that any disconnect would be healed and restored in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for giving us wisdom. I'm just thinking about that, that, that Chris said many times that children, that scripture, that children are like arrows yeah, for on. us. And I remember reading how um, every arrow, when, when the Bible was written, every arrow was different and it was formed differently and it was made from different materials and everyone was slightly different. And I felt God was giving us wisdom to strategically parent each child differently and that you are the perfect person to parent your child. That's why the Lord gave them and trusted them to you. And so I wanna pray that the Lord would give you wisdom that is specific to your child as you form that specific arrow. Um, And so God, I thank you for divine wisdom. And I know we're out of time, but I also am praying for a, a, a breakthrough from anxiety. I know a number of us, like, it feels like there's been a season of epidemic of anxiety. And I feel something on this halftime word is that we're going to come out as people of courage and the crippling anxiety ends in the name of Jesus. And so, God, I thank you for breakthrough. Anyone struggling with that, we say be healed in Jesus' name. Yeah. We love you guys. We're praying with you. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder to follow the links if you want to click on those. If you gave your heart to Jesus, looking for ministry, find that. Uh, But we love you guys, and we'll see you tonight for 6 p.m. service here. And uh, if not tonight, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so thankful that you do that every week, and we bless you guys. God bless you guys. See ya.